Well, thank you all again for joining us this evening. Um, we're excited for our final seminar of 2021 virtual with Ty Garica. Um, this evening, uh, we'll be learning about Ty's fisheries research at Little Row Lake, uh, which is about 30 kilometers north of Kingston. And it's important at this time to acknowledge the territory where we live, work, and play on. Um, Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Specifically, the Queen's University Biological Station, uh, which is hosting the seminar, is situated on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory and is part of the Algonquin land claim by the Algonquins of Ontario, currently under negotiation with the federal government of Canada. Acknowledging these facts requires recognition of pre-colonial history of this land and the people who live here and continue to live here. The cultures and spiritualities of Indigenous peoples are connected to the land and the land is an integral part of their way of knowing and living. These knowledge systems are continually evolving in relation to the land and its other inhabitants, both humans and other than human. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the areas of Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee roots. There is also a significant Métis community and there are first peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. Uh, reflecting on our responsibilities with Indigenous peoples and the place we are, the Biological Station continues to build meaningful, authentic and reciprocal relationships with Indigenous peoples. And with that, I'd like to introduce um, Bruce Tufts, Dr. Bruce Tufts, um, who will be introducing our speaker this evening. Um, Bruce, if you wouldn't mind. No problem. Um, so I'm gonna just keep this short, but I, I think it's important to, to tell the story about Ty's project. Uh, we have a collaborator who's an adjunct at Queen's, Mark Ridgway, who works for the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in Ontario. And um, for the past four years, Mark has sort of said to me that uh, he had this really interesting project that he thought um, would be something that somebody could use sampling by angling to get a really good uh, project completed on occupancy modeling. And um, Mark is a modeler and knows what he's doing and he helped tie a lot with this project. And, and uh, we needed the right student to come along who was uh, able to use the technique and use it in a scientific way and design a project and, and follow the protocol that uh, Mark had in mind. And I think Ty did a really good job with that. So uh, I think this is kind of nice to, to see the end result. And uh, with that, I'm gonna leave it to Ty to show us his data. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. Um... Just as a forewarning, uh, it's my first time presenting over Zoom, so please let me know if there's any issues. Um, also, my allergies are quite bad this time of the year, so I apologize if I'm uh, drinking some, some more water than I usually am. Um, but I'll get started. Um, so my title of my talk is Modeling Species Abundance with Imperfect Detection Using Angling. Um, I'd just like to start by thanking uh, my supervisors, Dr. Bruce Tufts and Dr. Mark Ridgway for all of your guidance and support throughout the whole process. Um, as well as Dr. John Small and Dr. Paul Blanchfield for sitting on my committee. Um, and also like to thank the Greenberg uh, Family Fund for providing the opportunity to complete fisheries research and all of the members of the Queen's Freshwater Fisheries Conservation Lab couldn't, uh, couldn't have done it without uh, all of you, uh, especially Randy Lindenblatt who assisted, assisted sorry, in data collection and uh, provided his cottage during um, my field season. Um, so to start things off, uh, some goals of fisheries management are to provide a diverse and sustainable fishery that can hold commercial and recreational fisheries to supply socioeconomic growth. Um, studies have shown that recreational angling satisfaction is not only increased from the total number of fish you catch, but also how diverse the catch is and how big a fish you catch. Um, and obviously commercial fishermen are also gonna be happy if they are catching, catching a lot of big fish. Um, with better fisheries, uh, government and local businesses uh, thrive and gain money from licenses um, license sales and tourism. But to be able to provide these fisheries, um, managers need to use important tools such as predicting species distribution and abundance to assess and learn the currency of the fishery. Understanding a species distribution can provide insight on critical habitat, on spawning grounds, species interactions, and then predicting species abundance um, can, help you, can, can help managers understand the current population sizes and diversity of their water body. Um, all of which allow you to manage regulations and hopefully maintain the diverse and sustainable fishery 
um, throughout the future. So my study, um, as Bruce mentioned, um, looked at how we could use abundance modeling uh, with imp imperfect detection to more accurately and efficiently determine habitat use and therefore predict species distributions. Um, it's actually very similar to mark recapture or ecological niche modeling, if you're familiar. Um, you collect count data to estimate probability of abundance uh, through multiple surveys of the same site and relate their abundance to habitat parameters. Uh, once you have gathered their habitat use estimates, you are able to apply it to predict species distribution uh, throughout the rest of the study area based on the area's habitat. A key component of my study is that it accounts for imperfect detection. Um, imperfect detection is very similar to false negatives, which can be very common um, in scientific studies uh, due to many confounding variables, such as weather, timing, uh, or other factors that can impact your ability to perceive the, study, the um, species that you're studying. Uh, which then in turn bias your parameter estimates. Uh, for example, I'll just take it out of the fisheries world for a minute. Um, if you're listening for the presence of a songbird species, um, but it's a windy day, you may not hear them over the rustling of the leaves, but that doesn't mean they aren't there. Um, so through this detection history, we can determine how these factors, such as wind in a forest, are affecting our estimates and account for them to create more accurate models. So abundance models have many uses, such as assessing habitat use, abundance, and distribution, as I previously mentioned. Um, you can also use this information to determine critical areas that species use uh, to create sanctuaries, to even re rehabilitate areas um, for an endangered species um, or other species to promote their success. You can also use the uh, model to predict how species distribution would be affected by changes in the environment. Um, as we all know, um, climate change uh, is a current thing and uh, it'll have impacts on, on our lakes. And we can incorporate these in these models to predict the changes um, uh, with the increasing climate. Stocking success can be assessed um, based on estimated population size and then decisions going forward about continuing or starting new stocking programs can be made. Uh, you can also predict the distribution of invasive species based on their known critical habitat um, to determine if it's likely that the species will be able to thrive in your environment. Uh, and lastly, another cool thing is that the models can be transferred um, over to other similar environments to predict distributions or priority areas there as well. And so I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, my study took place on Lower Lake. Um, my models could actually be transferred over to uh, other local lakes in Sydenham or Charleston uh, to predict species distribution in those areas as well, if you know the habitat of that lake. So a few examples of typical fishery sampling methods that can be used to develop abundance models are gill netting, seine netting, uh, trap and hoop netting, electric fishing and trawling. These traditional, uh, traditional sampling methods uh, have several advantages, such as they span large areas and depths. Uh, they're able to sample whole communities from tiny bait fish to uh, large predators. Um, and they gain life history information from biologically sampling their catch, um, such as the sex or age of fish. However, they do have their issues as well. Um, many of them are depletion sampling, uh, where they kill fish. They can get a lot of bycatch, such as birds and turtles. Um, they can also uh, only be completed in select environments. The gill netting, for example, uh, can struggle in really uh, in areas of high slope or high vegetation. And then you also have costly equipment, takes a lot of manpower um, and specialized equipment. So uh, as Bruce mentioned, through discussions with my co-supervisor, Dr. Um, Mark Ridgeway, we not only wanted to assess species distribution on a large scale with imperfect detection, which really hadn't been done in a fishery setting before, um, but also see if we could develop these abundance models through angling as my sampling tool. Um, the thought process to using angling as a sampling tool is that it can be completed in all environments, um, such as those uh, steep areas or shallow weedy areas. It's uh, non-depletion sampling and doesn't disturb the aquatic ecosystem like some of the traditional methods do. There are limitations to angling, such as you can only uh, efficiently sample predators that are large enough to eat typical fish and lures. Uh, so you won't be sampling the entire community, like those tiny little bait fish. You also gain no information on life history traits, such as age or sex of the fish, um, as you can only really do this by killing the fish. So if you are planning on doing catch and release, you can't gain that information. 
Um, and then with angling skill, there's two things that you, you can connect with it. Um, losing fish, uh, if you've ever been fishing, you know uh, losing fish is part of it. Um, and then you're not really able to fully accurately assess your site if you're not sure what species are there. And then if you're using multiple samplers, um, then angler skill may differ. Um, and unlike gill netting, where you can repeat the same amount of effort each and every time. So to, uh, to gain insight on the habitat use of plenty of local species um, during the summer, and to also test this angling sampling tool, uh, we really need to define the uh, perfect lake to complete our study on. Uh, we determined that was Lowboro Lake, um, as it not only contains uh, several species, but also a diverse range of environments. Lowboro Lake is essentially two lakes put into one, uh, connected through a channel. Uh, two basins are completely different and provide fish with a variety of habitat to choose from, making it an ideal site to study habitat use. Uh, the West Basin, um, as you can see at the uh, bottom of the screen here, uh, is a typical shield uh, style lake that has uh, steep shelves, it's mostly rock and sand bottom, and it's very deep. Um, the max depth was about 143 feet or about 43 meters. Um, it's long and narrow and with prevailing southwest wind can get quite large waves. Um, I even had to cancel a couple sampling days because of the wind. Um, then we have the east basin, which is much more like a Kawartha lake. It's very shallow, flat, uh, you know, with that mucky organic bottom and has tons of vegetation. Um, this basin also features many islands and bays, giving it protection from the wind for fish. Um, so these are some of the species that are found in Lowborough Lake. Um, these are actually photos that I took out in the field. Uh, we have black crappie, rock bass, uh, largemouth bass, pumpkin seed, bluegill, and smallmouth. Uh, and then finally, we have yellow perch, northern pike, and uh, lake trout. Um, unfortunately, you will not see uh, any more about northern pike or black crappie, as I did not catch enough of them to complete modeling. I was quite surprised by this from talking to um, locals, like such as Randy from the lab, um, who's been there for a long time, I expected to catch quite a few pike, uh, especially with how, how aggressive they are. Um, but uh, I, I wasn't able to. Uh, I didn't accept to, expect to uh, catch a ton of crappie, as I've heard they're pretty tough to catch in the summer and just from personal experience, uh, they are pretty tough to find in the summer. I was hoping to stumble upon a school of them uh, somewhere, but that didn't end up happening, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so now I'm just going to get a bit into uh, my sampling methods. Uh, I developed a strict and consistent angling protocol where I sampled 148 uh, one hectare sites three times each. Each round took me about nine days of sampling uh, and I use different baits for different depths and fish sizes. Uh, and I'll cover that in my next slide. Um, I also had to stick to a certain number of casts in each direction and really th think like a sampler and not an angler, which is really difficult for me as I've been fishing my entire life. Um, but once I caught a fish, I identified the species, I measured the fish as I was only looking at adult fish for my studies. So um, over 150 millimeters for most of the species, then over 250 millimeters for largemouth and smallmouth bass. And then I also counted all lake trout. Um, in my protocol, it wasn't only fish that I caught, but I also countered visual identifications through wearing polarized glasses um, and also lake trout that uh, appeared on the lower end's graph below 20 meters, um, as I expected this to be the only species occupying this area. Uh, if you're not a fisherman, uh, when you're vertically jigging lake trout, you can really see them on uh, your, your uh, graph unit. Um, and they kind of have like a specific behavior that I could identify. Um, and then I only counted visual identifications to um, like my polarized sunglasses uh, if I was 100% sure on the species. Um, the table at the bottom just shows the number of sites uh, I sampled in each depth class based on the percentage of that depth class in each basin. Um, now, this was kind of the fun part for me. Um, I know uh, a lot of people don't get to fish for their master's project, um, so I'm pretty lucky. Um, but this was my angling protocol. Uh, for less than uh, three meters and three to six meters, I had both a small predator and large predator protocol. 
Um, for small predators, I used a small uh, white twister tail on a jig that you can see in the bottom left photo there. Um, for large predators, I split my cast between a black and blue Senko on a rugby uh, head and a white spinnerbait just to kind of cover the whole, whole water column. Um, and then at deep, uh, deeper sites, we didn't expect to catch uh, too many small predators um, just based on uh, literature and uh, personal experience. Um, but we used a drop shot bait that could catch smaller um, fish as well, um, but was really effective at catching fish at these depths. And then if the uh, site was 12 meters deeper, uh, we used a white tube, which um, from personal experience I'm talking to a lot of locals is kind of the uh, bait of choice for targeting lake trout. Um, after I developed the protocol, um, next I needed to determine what habitat use parameters I wanted to measure um, to really be able to accurately predict these species distribution um, based on factors that typically affect fish distribution. Um, so I settled on um, easting and basin uh, as species could identify with one basin or specific regions of the lake if they wanted to. Um, depth as it uh, affects species distribution through temperature and vegetation. Uh, slope and fetch as it also affects vegetation growth um, through substrate or physical disturbance um, of waves. Um, all of these habitat factors um, can be used to predict species distribution across the entire lake through developing maps of ArcGIS. Um, so to gather all of these covariates, um, transects of the entire lake uh, were actually completed to gather um, depth, slope, and easting information and we created a bathymetry map. Um, doing these transects took a really long time. Uh, I really do appreciate Randy's help being a spotter and driver. Uh, I think it took around 10 days to do all of the transects. Um, they were about 100, 200 meters apart, depending on the basin. Uh, and we even had to go back and, and go over some more specific areas to uh, create a really nice bathymetry map. Um, and then to gather our fetch data, uh, a fetch model was developed that gave the distance a wind could travel across the lake based on a prevailing southwest wind. Uh, and finally, for each um, five by five meter cell, uh, the average depth, slope, and fetch were calculated uh, to use for modeling purposes. Um, now I have vegetation here with a little star, um, and that's because I also did measure vegetation covariates such as presence, height, and density, um, but these estimates uh, couldn't be used in my maps. Um, so doing all those transects gave me the ability um, to have the other covariates across the entire lake, um, but I wasn't I was I was unable to obtain vegetation information across the lake, so I can't predict across the entire lake. Um, so these covariates were modeled individually um, just to assess species preference uh, when it comes to vegetation. Um, then I needed to, needed to uh, measure some factors that I would uh, think would uh, affect my perception of the fish, um, as I was talking about those false negatives. Um, so uh, we came up with cloudy, um, cloudiness, so if it's cloudy or not, um, how wind would affect it, which I just measured uh, if it was windy or not. Time, uh, a lot of fishermen, you know, try to wake up for first light and get out there. Um, so I measured that in minutes from midnight, and then also the depth um, that I that I thought that the fish was actually caught in. Um, I expected all these factors to influence uh, fish behavior or my my ability to uh, visually identify fish. Um, I uh, I don't want to get too into the nitty gritty of modeling um, because I think that would put you to sleep if I haven't already. Uh, but it was all completed in program R using the unmarked package uh, and mixed models were created based on a prior hypotheses, uh, which basically means I wasn't going to model lake relationship with vegetation, for example, um, because I already know that they don't have one based on their biology. They're a deep water species and they, they aren't going to relate to vegetation at all. Um, all site covariates were standardized in order to predict across the entire lake. Um, and then once models were run, uh, were run the uh, top models within two delta AIC uh, were model averaged for both habitat models and detection models. Uh, the habitat use estimates were then plugged into our uh, base map to develop distribution maps. 
Um, so essentially, if you remember back to when I said average depth slope uh, fetch was calculated for each little cell, uh, the beta estimates from my model averaging were essentially just multiplied to those averages uh, to determine the abundance in that cell for each species. Um, overall, I observed uh, over 1,500 fish over the, uh, the three rounds of sampling, which averages to around 500 fish per round, sorry. Um, so I'm just going to uh, take a minute to really describe uh, what you're looking at here. As um, you'll, you'll see uh, one of these slides for each of the seven species that I was able to model for. Um, so on the top table, we have our model average habitat estimates that are significant covariates and um, they all change for each species. The uh, binomials or squared terms of depth and fetch were modeled as we predicted a nonlinear relationship with these covariates. Um, interactions were also used to determine if depth and eastern relationships uh, were different between the basins. So in these tables, um, a negative value means that a decreased abundance, whereas a positive value means increased abundance. Uh, it does get a little tricky. Uh, you're looking at binomials and interactions. Um, I'll just keep it in general terms. Um, our bottom table shows our detection model results, which will show how our factors influence detection. Uh, so again, these will change for each species uh, and a negative value decreased detectability and a positive increased detectability. Um, for each species, you'll also see two plots. So the uh, top right plot shows the abundance and depth relationship um, uh, and, and the relationship in each of the basins. Um, so blue is the east basin and red is the west basin. Um, so depth is typically an important factor. Um, so I really wanted to focus on this and the interaction uh, with the basin was usually uh, significant, which is why I show the relationship in uh, both of the basins. The uh, bottom right plot shows the abundance and fetch relationship. Um, I was specifically interested in looking at fetch as it usually is a, a major factor for vegetation growth. Um, the basin interaction wasn't typically significant. Uh, so for the fetch models, you'll only see uh, one gray model just because it's a general model across both basins. Um, and I'll also probably just focus on speaking about a quick couple interesting points for each species, um, just again, so I don't, I don't bore you to death. Um, so I'll uh, move on to a uh, large mouth. Um, so a negative relationship was found with depth. Um, different depth relationship was also found in either basin, which you can see in the top right. Um, not many largemouth uh, were found in general in the West Basin, um, but when they were, there wasn't a major difference across, um, across depth. And in, east, in the East Basin, uh, we see that a lot more largemouth are found in shallow water. Um, the average model had a pretty insignificant relationship with fetch, um, but looking at our plot, we can see that largemouth abundance peaked in protected areas. Um, slight negative relationship with easting, um, which we'll see how that influences the distribution in our map, which is coming up next. Uh, and then finally, detection negatively influenced um, by time and wind, uh, which was really what I expected. Um, I'm a salmon fisherman, so I'm used to getting up pretty early because uh, that's when the best bite happens. Um, so uh, here you can see our map. Um, so when we use these habitat use estimates and plug them into our GIS map, uh, we get a distribution heat map. So uh, red shows our high density and uh, blue shows our low density areas uh, with the yellow being the in-between. So looking at our map, we can see that largemouth were found in uh, shallow protected areas of the basin. So if you remember back to that slight negative easting relationship, um, we see that it pushes our highest densities to the western part of the east basin. Um, through literature um, backgrounds, I suspected this is what largemouth distribution would be like, um, but expected quite a few more along the shorelines of the West Basin. Um, yeah, I kind of thought that the entire shoreline would have would hold largemouth, um, so I was kind of surprised by that. Um, and I also expected a much higher abundance in, in the northeastern part of the lake. Um, I'm not a, not. Uh, exactly sure why that is. Um, there is a little bit different habitat um, and a little bit less protected in areas and it does 
have a little bit more depth, but again, I still expected uh, the shorelines to hold quite a few large mouth there. Uh, moving on to smallmouth, um, you see that it's much more complex than largemouth, um, just based on the number of variables, but also because there isn't really one that is heavily weighted to really drive the distribution. Um, it's a much larger effect by easting, which was negative, um, and fetch, which was positive. Um, we can see in the fetch plot that smallmouth abundance uh, was actually lowest in the most protected areas, um, which, which is the opposite of large mouth. Um, there's less of an impact um, from depth, but there's still a, a difference between basins. Uh, you can see that it's quite a flat relationship, again, across West basins. Um, abundance was, was found pretty stable. Um, whereas in the uh, East basin, you can see that it, it peaks a lot more in in the, in the highest depths of that basin. Um, detection was uh, surprisingly positively influenced by time, uh, which was not what I expected. Uh, I guess if you're not a, a morning person, um, and you don't really want to get up early, uh, you can still have a good day from a small, small fishing. Um, so maybe I should consider switching to, to be a small guy uh, so I can sleep in a little bit. Um, we now see that our uh, negative relationship with easting pushes the smallmouth to only really be found in the Western Basin. Um, as you can see, the, the entire uh, East Basin is quite blue, um, very low, low densities in that area. Um, and we see our peak abundances are uh, shallow to intermediate depths um, uh, in, the, in the West Basin there. And they were uh, mostly found on sandy flats and drop-offs um, beside them, uh, along with rocky shelves and humps. Um, literature talks uh, a lot about small being found on rock and uh, more open areas comparatively to large mouth. Um, but the surprising part to me was finding them on the edge of uh, sandy flats um, and sometimes even up on them. Um, just from personal experience, uh, I, I didn't really expect that. And moving on to rock bass. Um, which I don't think a rock species distribution map has ever been created. Uh, I don't think there's a ton of people interested in it. Um, but uh, we can see that rock bass is a little bit simpler. Um, again, it has uh, depth as a major factor for the distribution. Um, pretty similar uh, depth relationship between basins when we look at our plot, um, but there are definitely more rock bass in very shallow areas. Uh, positive easting but negative interaction, which uh, we can look at our map on the next slide to see how that influences their distribution. There's a slightly positive slope factor, which I wasn't quite expecting for rock bass um, from literature. Um, they're, they're, they're usually close to shore on rocks and, uh, and weed beds. And then our uh, fetch plot shows that they did prefer more protected areas. Um, you'll see in some of the plots that our error increases at high fetch, um, which kind of makes you think that uh, they're also found kind of high fetch levels, but I don't think this is exactly the case. It's just, I think it's just because abundance increases. Um, sorry, um, I just think it's because of how very few are caught at high fetches. Um, and that just results in a lot of variance in that big error bar. Um, so when you look at our map, um, Easting and its basin interaction that I had mentioned show that they're mostly found in the middle of the lake um, or really in that western part of the East Basin, um, which if you're familiar with the Lowborough Lake, um, this middle part of the lake is very unique. Uh, it's an interesting transition zone. Uh, it has a very deep channel running through it, which hosts a lot of the boat traffic uh, when people are traveling between the basins. Um, but habitat wise, uh, it's very shallow on, on either side of of the channel and drops off quite quickly. Um, and then there's a weed line uh, on, that, on that transition from the shallow sandy to the drop off. Um, and they were found a lot in that area. Um, in general, um, they share a lot of those um, shallow protected bays uh, with largemouth. Um, just moving on to pumpkin seed. Um, again, a little bit more basic as they have that that negative relationship with depth, um, which is really driving their distribution. Um, we can see the degree of our curve and our depth plot um, that at really shallow depths, there is a lot of pumpkin seed. Um, similar depth pattern in each basin, 
um, just magnified in the East Basin as they were really abundant. And pumpkin seed were definitely my most abundant species that I observed. The uh, negative relationship with fetch and a, a slight negative relationship with easting. Um, our fetch plot shows that they do peak in protected areas, um, which are expected. Um, they're very much um, uh, a vegetated oriented fish. Um, so we see that uh, their distribution was quite similar to largemouth. Um, there's peak abundances in shallow protected bays of the East Basin, um, which was uh, what, what, what we expected to find from our depth and fetch relationships that we saw in our table. Um, our negative easting value again shows that uh, the highest abundances were at the western portion of the East Basin. Um, so, so far, if I was telling someone to go fishing, I would tell them to. Uh, to go to the, the shallow protected bays uh, where they will probably be able to find quite a few fish. Um, looking at bluegill, uh, we see our, our negative easting relationship. Um, and then we see a negative depth relationship, um, but it's not really as large of an impact as other centrarchids uh, that we just looked at, such as our large bass, rock bass, and pumpkin seed. Um, interestingly, opposite depth relationships between the basins. Um, so abundance decreases with depth in the west basin, um, but increases with the east. Um, so this could be due to the presence of a lot of pumpkin seed in the east basin. Um, they are competitors, so but uh, bluegill can adapt uh, much easier to become, to become uh, filter feeders and feed on zoo plankton in open areas. Uh, while pumpkin seed eat more crustaceans in the shallow water. Um, so uh, we see a positive relationship with fetch and slope. Um, and we can see that the uh, peak abundance of bluegill occurs at high fetch levels. Um, detection negatively influenced by time and cloud. Um, interestingly, positively influenced by wind. Um, I'm not exactly sure uh, why this is. Um, could be because of their preference for more open water areas and uh, just the likelihood of there being one present or um, possibly something to do with uh, prey that they're feeding on uh, in wind action. Um, peak abundance for bluegill, <clears throat> as you can see, occurred in the West Basin uh, with a slight broad distri distribution across the East Basin. Um, again, uh, uh, in the East Basin, that, that broad distribution, I think, is just because of the competition of pumpkin seed pushed out to the deeper waters. Um, but uh, specifically, they prefer the shallow open areas of the, uh, the West Basin, <clears throat> um, which if you're familiar with the lake, is uh, very like sandy uh, flats and, uh, and wheat in pretty much the most weedy areas of the West Basin. Um, that are right beside the drop-offs before it gets into really deep water. Um, so I'm not sure if this gives them the uh, ability to feed on uh, in shallow waters as well as open waters, and uh, that's why uh, they uh, prefer this area, these areas. Um, for our yellow perch, um, we see a, a very simple distribution uh, as they have the most extreme negative relationship with depth. Um, if you're looking at the plot, um, you can see that peak abundance occurs at very, very shallow depth um, and, and drastically decreases as you move up deeper. Um, they have a similar trend uh, between, between basins, but a much higher abundance in the West Basin. Um, they're negatively influenced by fetch. Um, and as we can see in our plot, um, it suggests that peak abundance occurs in protected areas. Uh, looking at our map, it might be um, a little difficult to see <laughs> where the peak abundances are, um, but that's just because um, they're in such such shallow areas in the West Basin and limited to pr the protected areas um, that they're like right along the shoreline of the lake. Um, a lot of these areas are extremely dense in yellow perch. Um, and a lot of the areas highlighted in red are, uh, are very shallow sandy flats that hold uh, stocky vegetation. Um, and based on literature, I didn't really expect this to be the case, 
Um, I didn't really think that they would be found on, on very shallow sandy flats. Uh, I thought that uh, during the summer months, they would really school up in a bit deeper water uh, out in more, more open areas. Um, but they may be able to hide from predators with the sand and soggy vegetation and really blend in in that environment. Um, and last but not least, um, I'm sure if there is anyone uh, watching from the Lower Lake Association, uh, you're quite interested in the lake trout results. Uh, very popular sport fishing uh, fishing for the lake. Um, so as expected, um, there is a positive influence by depth. Um, looking at our plot, you can see that uh, peak abundance uh, occurred at, at intermediate depths. Um, they're only found in the West Basin, so that's why you only see the red plot, not the blue. Um, and there's also a positive relationship with slope and, and easting. Um, cloud cover uh, extremely decreased the chance of detection of lake trout, um, which I found very interesting. Uh, and I'm still honestly not sure, sure why that's the case. Um, I expected them uh, to be found in deeper areas. Um, so looking at, at our map, you can see pretty much any uh, intermediate depth in the West Basin uh, with high slope uh, is their peak areas with the highest densities. Um, uh, I mean, for their biology, they need cold water. So that's why I really expect them to be found at, at such, such, such deep depths. Um, and I also kind of expected this from an angling perspective, uh, but the high slope um, attraction was quite interesting. Um, it could be because uh, typically steep shelves hold currents for colder and more oxygenated water. Um, that may be attractive for lake trout and why they hang out there, um, as long as, uh, as well as uh, maybe potential feeding patterns. And so next up, um, I just noticed that there was two separate gr uh, groups of species um, that kind of share the same areas. Uh, so one group in the west basin, uh, which was the smallmouth, bluegill, and yellow perch, and then the uh, other three centricred species in, in the east basin. Um, so I then wanted to overlay these species um, just to see if they were um, if there were areas where they really overlapped and had a high probability of interaction between the species. Um, and this could potentially show if there's predation occurring, which could be another driver of their distribution. Um, so for these maps, uh, green is low overlap, so uh, low probability of interactions, and then purple is, is high overlap, suggesting that these species would be interacting here. Um, so you can see in the uh, shallow areas, um, kind of around the, uh, the bottom of the lake here, and then the northern part of the uh, western basin, there was high degree of interactions in these areas. Um, literature has shown that smallmouth do feed on both perch and bluegill. Um, and maybe they're using these uh, shallow flats to feed on these species. Um, and they could be located on the, uh, the edges of these flats, um, kind of maybe in the cooler water and then uh, going up feeding purposes. And then when we uh, go over and look at the Eastern uh, Basin overlay, um, which uh, again was largemouth and rock, rock bass, I'm sorry, not rock mouth bass, um, overlaid with pumpkin seed. Um, you can see that there are, again, uh, high areas uh, of, of high probability of species interacting, the purple areas in the uh, protected bays, along with like a little bit of a blue-green um, in these areas where, where they could also be interacting. Uh, literature, literature, again, shows that a rock bass, and especially largemouth, um, love to feed on pumpkin seed. Um, and in these shallow, shallow bays with uh, lots of vegetation, uh, they typically use this vegetation as an ambush tactic um, to feed on their prey. Um, so getting back to uh, my vegetation results, and um, not only does it appear that there's possibly predation occurring, um, but through vegetation estimates, I believe that there is uh, habitat uh, partitioning occurring between these species that are, are interacting a lot. Um, so by looking at uh, vegetation presence, uh, which is the first column, uh, VP, uh, vegetation height, and vegetation density, 
Um, we can see that um, looking at the Eastern Basin species, um, largemouth preferred tall and dense vegetation, uh, again, likely using it to, to ambush prey. And then rock bass, as I had mentioned, um, preferred that tall vegetation that was along those uh, transitional areas of the shallow sandy flats, deep channels, um, possibly again using that, that cover as an ambush tactic. Um, pumpkin seed uh, were promoted uh, the most by vegetation presence out of those three species, um, but preferred uh, taller and less dense vegetation. Um, you know, largemouth really loved that really thick, dense vegetation, um, which I also expected uh, pumpkin seed to, to really be attracted to just from, from literature background research. Um, but I guess, I guess if you're the predators there, then, then it's not ideal, not ideal to be a um, And then flipping back over to the West Basin, smallmouth distribution was really not driven by uh, vegetation. Um, so then when looking back at that positive relationship with fetch, it makes sense as the higher the fetch level typically results in less vegetation. Um, they're likely to, like I said, again, um, they're likely to be sitting on that edge of the thermocline, um, possibly using, um, you know, uh, shallow sandy flats, flats to feed. Um, bluegill preferred dense but short vegetation, uh, whereas the yellow perch really enjoyed the taller vegetation. Um, so that stocky vegetation and the shallow sand flats um, which uh, can be seen with their preference for, um, you know, that, that tall, not dense vegetation. It's, I don't really want to call them reeds, but it, there's just like these stalks of vegetation uh, up on those sandy flats. Um, and finally here, um, we're my final species density uh, estimates. Um, so we just have our uh, abundance per hectare in both the west density, uh, in the west basin, sorry, and the east basin. Um, so largemouth, rock bass, and pumpkin seed are more abundant in the East Basin, uh, which is kind of what I expected. Um, again, I really did think that there'd be more largemouth in those shallow, shallow areas of the West Basin. Um, smallmouth, much more abundant in the West Basin. Then yellow perch and bluegill appear to be a little bit more widespread between, um, between the basins. Um, but as you can see from those maps, those really red high peak abundance areas were found in the West Basin for those species. Um, so just some habitat use conclusions. Um, through my research, I was able to develop uh, abundance models that were able to provide insight into the summer habitat use of seven species. Um, in general, a broad distribution was not found for the centrarchids as there are very regional or basin specific relationships that resulted in uh, peak abundances in their preferred habitat. Um, one of these, the reasons these species may not have been broadly distributed um, is because of the variation of fetch being a surrogate for vegetation. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, those, those high, high fetch areas are likely to have a lot of vegetation, but those protected areas are where vegetation can really thrive. Um, so in protected areas, vegetation able to grow, hold those species um, that prefer, prefer it, such as the largemouth, rock bass, and uh, pumpkin seed that I found, and then the more open areas containing you know, that smallmouth and bluegill, um, they can use those open areas a lot more. Um, lake trout, um, I did uh, really expect to, you know, obviously only find them in the West Basin, at hypolimnetic habitat. Know, below the thermocline, that nice cold oxygenated water. Um, but it was very interesting to me to find that peak abundance at high slope. And then um, finally here, just the habitat partitioning um, and the species interactions for predation. Um, so just going back to those overlay maps, um, you can see that there, there are um, definitely areas where they interact and potentially could be some predation occurring, um, which could be another driver of the distribution. And then my angling conclusions, um, as I was kind of testing this, you know, this, this new uh, sampling technique, I personally thought it was very successful. Uh, it provided me with uh, you know, great data for creating my models. I was able to successfully identify these regional patterns of distribution. Um, and not only uh, that, but I found it quite fun. Uh, I was able to sample uh, steep shelves in shallow weedy areas. Um, I did it all as one person. Um, wasn't much manpower um, necessary. 
Um, there's also virtually no mortality, as I think, uh, if I remember correctly, two pumpkin seed died over 27 days of sampling, uh, which I thought was, was pretty good. Um, there, there were its limitations, as I did not catch all the species that I really expected to, such as those northern pike. Um, and I did lose um, some fish, which I think, you know, uh, maybe those, those were some of those northern pike that, that, I, that I missed and lost. Um, and maybe could have resulted in me being able to, to create a distribution map. Um, and then finally, I also have no information um, on life history of these fish. So I was unable to, uh, you know, get the age or sex distribution of the lake. Um, but overall, uh, I thought it was a great uh, experience. And then just looking into uh, future directions, uh, I think, you know, with a, with a changing world, climate change, land use changes, uh, we should continue to research the habitat use of our fish species in order to manage them properly. Um, these models are also transferable to other lakes. I think it'd be really interesting, um, you know, to put them on uh, a lake such as Charleston or Sydenham, that I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, to be able to predict these species distribution and identify critical areas if they're ever needed. Um, if we see, you know, crashes of populations or something um, and, and need to create sanctuaries of some sort. Um, and then with the uh, success of the angling protocol, um, I think that we should continue to develop it, test it as a sampling tool, and maybe even try it species specific if you're interested in only in individual species. Um, so maybe you're, you're really interested in Northern Pike or you're really interested in, in Lake Trout and can really change um, the protocol um, to really be specific to those species. Um, you know, and, and if continued success is found, I think lake managers would be able to use it. Um, you know, it could reduce manpower, um, time and costs while still providing, um, you know, excellent data. Um, finally, uh, I think that there's a spot to use uh, citizen science information from recreational and maybe even commercial fishermen uh, to help develop these models and continue to uh, assess distribution uh, over time. Um, it could be a little tricky just because, uh, even from experience, fishermen uh, aren't too apt on, on providing uh, details about where they caught their fish. Um, but I do think that there is um, you know, a cool opportunity uh, to partner with fishermen and, and develop uh, very cool distribution maps. Um, so with that, I'd just like to uh, thank everyone um, for coming and listening to my talk. Um, and if you have any questions, um, please let me know. Thank you so much, Ty. If anyone would like to ask a question, they could do so using the chat or by unmuting themselves. Hey there, Ty, it's uh, Paul Collin here. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yeah, yeah, I got you, Paul. Yeah, hey, great talk. Um, really interesting findings. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about uh, a couple of things. One is your your habitat assessments. So you you know you talked a little bit about habitat use and um, and then you know from a DFO perspective, I often think of habitat in a physical habitat sense. And we think about you know rocks and cobbles and tree and things like that. Talk a lot right. about sandy flats and other things. So did you did you quantify any of those type of physical habitat variables? Um, not too much. I I was going to try to do some sort of substrate, um, but through recording substrate, mm -hmm. I found that um, you know the eastern basin was mostly just all uh, you know that organic mucky bottom. Um, with very few few rocks and stuff like that, um, and then you know the West Basin, all just that sandy and rock um, on that steep shelf. Um, so I, I really thought that that um, you know th those basin interactions in that basin term really represented the substrate. Okay, yeah, what, yeah. I was curious with, you, with your fetch. Um idea and model like Globro is a really funny lake for a fetch right mm -hmm. you, can, you can obviously have some probably strong winds from the, the northwest or and that would that would have no effect for fetch right 
um, where the opposite, if they, if it goes on the long axis of that lake, you could get quite a fetch, right? You do. Yeah. You can get, you know, you know, over three footers, uh, yeah. three foot waves uh, on, on the West, West basin. So, yeah. So I'm curious, do you think, like you talked about some protected bays, but they're protected under certain fetch conditions or wind conditions. And so in your sampling time period there, did you kind of, go across a range of, of wind events and? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would try to get out on, uh, as long as it was safe for me to get out. Um, there were a couple windy days on that West Basin where I was still able to sample, um, you know, battle the seasickness a little bit. Uh, but uh, there was definitely a range. Um, yeah, I mean, specifically in the Eastern Basin um, with all those islands, um, in those bays, it's not a huge fetch range, um, but I was able to, to get a little bit of range on the, on the West Basin. Yeah, interesting. All right. Yeah, well, thanks a lot, Ty. Great talk. Oh, no, no, thank you for coming, Paul. Ty, I'm going to jump in and ask a question. It's um, yeah. I enjoyed your talk. I've seen the data come along and and uh, it's very interesting. Um, I, I get the sense that it it gives you a really good indication of of relative abundance uh, in terms of you know different parts of the lake and where you're going to find more of a given species. I'm intrigued at the zero end like. In the West Basin, for example, you said you might have expected that you'd catch largemouth. And as somebody that spends lots of time on Lower Lake, I think there's lots of largemouth in the West Basin. So I'm, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on that in terms of, you know, what a zero means in your study. And is there anything that, you know, uh, Anything in the in the study that you could do to to try to more accurately deal with that part of things? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there were uh, you know so, some large amount found there. I just thought that that it would be at a higher density. Um, I guess uh, I can go back to the uh, density estimates. Just to take a look uh, if you'd like. Um, just to this table here. Um, but yeah, I guess, uh, I guess a zero in my study would be where you expect to catch, um, no large amount. It may be really tough to see on that, uh, that West Basin map, just the clarity with, uh, you know, the shoreline and uh, a lighter yellow color, but maybe a different color palette, uh, palette might be better to see. Uh, I guess I never really thought about that one. Uh, okay, so but I guess, I, I didn't see them, but you've got you've got some detections for largemouth in the West Basin. I do, yeah. Um, okay. I guess just just not as many as I, I truly expected. Yeah. Okay. Um, but but uh, you know, to your point, um, you know, if you were really interested in in specifically largemouth distribution, uh, you know, maybe you could. Uh, modify our sampling protocol to really target largemouth um, and really identify those specific critical habitats in both of the basins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that's nice. That's good. I think it, I just didn't see it on the heat map. Yeah, um, I can go back to see. Um, just give me a second here. Um, you can see a little bit yellow shading. Um, along the shorelines. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, specifically, yeah. Just up in, you know, uh, this area in the northern part here and in the southern part, just pretty much anywhere, uh, you know, some of that vegetation was found um, before it, before it uh, dropped off into to really, really deep areas. Okay, thanks. Oh, no worries.
Okay, I think there isn't any other questions from the audience. I want to thank you again, Ty, for presenting in our final 2021 CUBE seminar series and sharing your work, which was really interesting. And thank you to everyone that tuned in today. We'll have the video up if you want to pass along, and it'll be on our YouTube channel. So thank you again, Ty, and thank you, everyone, for participating and listening in. Well, thank you for having me and, and organizing the talk. Thanks, Sonia. Mm -hmm.